In this video, I'm going to give you a tour of the TMJ, primarily using bite effects animations that have been created over many years with the input and direction from a plethora of TMJ experts. Understanding the TMJ is important for dentists, orthodontists, and anyone having major tooth work, as it's the foundation on which that work is built. If the TMJ is unstable or changing, the way the teeth contact is going to be changing, and it won't take long for teeth that looked and felt good to start feeling strange. We have another video that goes into why the TMJ is important. Check the links below for that one. Many say that the TMJ is the most complex joint in the body and is the only joint designed to dislocate as part of its normal function. This tour will give you insights into many of the joint's complexities, but it's not going to cover every detail of those complexities. You won't be heading to the dissection table after this tour, but you should feel you have a reasonable idea of how it works and, in part two, how it can deteriorate when things go wrong. We'll start our tour with this simple cross-section of the temporomandibular joint. As some non-medical people will watch this video, those with medical training, please bear with me for a few seconds as I introduce the parts of the joint. This part here is called the condyle and is the part of the jaw that fits in the socket in the skull. The hollow that receives the condyle is called the fossa. The front part of the fossa that comes down here is called the eminence. The orange part is the TMJ disc, best thought of as being like cowhide, bendy, but essentially incompressible in the short term. Most of our animations show the ligaments that attach the disc to the body as thin strands extending out from the disc. Then, behind the disc, shown here in yellow, is the retrodiscal tissue. It's spongy and fills any spaces in the fossa caused by the condyle moving out of the fossa. Then, there are two muscles that attach to the disc or the condyle to move the condyle forward and control the position of the disc when the condyle returns to the fossa. These muscles are called the upper and lower lateral pterygoid muscles. Playing the animation, which goes through a wide opening motion, you can see how the condyle moves out of the socket to achieve that wide opening. It's pulled there by the lower pterygoid. The disc tracks with the condyle. The retrodiscal tissue fills the space in the fossa when needed. And the upper pterygoid muscle tenses as the condyle returns to its fully seated position in the fossa. I should also remark that the green lines are not in the TMJ anatomy. We added them to show when the condyle is in its fully seated position. For some patients, the condyle is often not in its fully seated position, so it's good to have these reference lines to make it clear when an animation is illustrating that not fully seated in the fossa condition. Now let's get into the tour looking at different components and behaviours of the TMJ. At the centre of the TMJ is the condyle. It's not quite the simple shape we showed in the 2D view. It may seem long and narrow when viewed from the side, but when we look at it from the back or front, we see it is quite broad and bulbous at the top. When the jaw rotates, that rotation is about the medial, inner, poles of the condyles. The broad heads of the condyles are at a slight angle to the axis of rotation. The condyle fits in the fossa. Here we see a cutaway of the bone around the fossa with some brain visible through the hole. The point here is to register that the top part of the fossa has rather thin bone and there's not much between the TMJ and that precious brain. So the condyle cannot be pushing against the top of the fossa, otherwise it would be in danger of breaking through to the brain cavity. You'll see in a few minutes that there are strong jaw closing muscles that pull the jaw and condyle upwards. The force of that push is borne by the thick bone at the front of the fossa. That's where the majority of the pressure is applied and that's why the bone is thick there. Now we look at the fossa from different angles. Fill in the part we cut out and add a net to help you appreciate the shape of the fossa. Note that we've dropped the condyle down so you can see the fossa. It's not usual for the condyle to be that low. We'll move the condyle back into its normal position and add a 3D disc capsule and some retrodiscal tissue, though it's mostly cut away so you can see the disc capsule. Now let's consider how the jaw moves in different directions. If the opening is not very wide, the jaw just rotates. For wider opening, it has to translate as well as rotate. 
Without the translation, the lower part of the jaw would rotate back too far and cause the airway to be blocked. Not a good thing to happen. For pure protrusive movement, sliding the jaw forwards, keeping the front teeth touching, the jaw only translates, it doesn't rotate. Moving the jaw to one side or the other involves pulling one condyle forward. To move the front of the jaw to the left, the right condyle is moved forward. To move the front of the jaw to the right, the left condyle is moved forward. Notice that because of the eminence, the front part of the fossa, the condyle that is being pulled forward also drops down. Let's return to a side view to see what muscles are controlling the opening and closing movements. To open, the closing muscles, currently shown to be tense by the deep pink colour, need to relax, shown by turning blue, and the muscle under the chin, called the digastric muscle, tenses, shown by the muscle turning red, and pulls the jaw down. Then, as the mouth opens wider, the lower pterygoid activates to pull the condyle forward. When we switch to closing, you will see all the muscles change their state. The digastric and lower pterygoid relax, shown by them going back to blue. The closing muscles, the masseter, temporalis and medial pterygoid, that muscle is not shown, they tense, shown by them turning red. And the upper pterygoid muscle also tenses, helping to keep the disc in place as the condyle settles back into the fossa. Note first how throughout this motion the disc tracks with the head of the condyle, always staying between the condyle and the eminence and fossa. And secondly, how strong the closing muscles are. You know that has to be the case by your ability to crunch or bite into pretty hard food. Back to a 3D view. First, without muscles and disc. We show where the pressure is between the condyle and fossa and eminence. See how the pressure at the fully seated position is forward of the top of the fossa and on the inward, medial, side of the condyle. Then, as the jaw opens, that pressure area moves down the eminence and from the medial to the lateral pole of the condyle. We repeat the motion adding in the disc and then the lateral pterygoid muscles. So that's a quick view of the TMJ in its healthy state. We'll look into some of the ways things can go wrong in the TMJ in part two of this TMJ tour. If you'd like to keep learning with animations like the ones you saw in this video, then we'd suggest using our study aid in conjunction with Dr. Dawson's definitive book, Functional Occlusion, From TMJ to Smile Design. The animations walk side by side each chapter to give you the best visual and content-rich learning experience to take you to a solid understanding of the TMJ and occlusion. The book is available through Amazon or through Dr. Dawson's publishing company, Widium, and the study aid is available through us. I put the links in the description below.